You know, when Jesus promised his disciples that he had asked the Father to send them a divine helper, he did. He, he gave this helper a special name. They were kind of sad. You know, things were winding up, and, and the spirit there was sad. They were sad that he was leaving. He was the one that was in charge of this deal. They didn't have any power. They didn't have anything any of that. And he said, look, 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 I'm going to send you the spirit of truth. I'm going to send you another helper. The Father's going to send you the spirit of truth. At the, at the same time, he, he warned them that the world would not be able to receive this helper. He, the world can't get him. Can't even see him. His words are recorded in John 14, 16, 17. Remember, this is about hypocrisy. And I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Forever. That's not until you, know, you die or whatever. It's forever. The Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. That, 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 that right there is a huge implication of, of things. It implies so much. we got people out there trying to get people to understand spirits of truth and spirits of deepness and so forth. They can't without the Holy Spirit. You're speaking into the wind and nothing happening. Your words are hitting the floor. But he said, but you know him, for he dwells with you. And will be in you. He had to blow on, on them once in a while and throw, put the Holy Spirit on them and in them just to understand the revelation that he was trying to tell them. At times he'd just wag his head and go, how long am I going to be with you? And then he, you know, he'd forget, I'm just speaking with mere men. Have some mercy here. So he did. <clears throat> Father, I ask you to give us wisdom and understanding, please, sir, about this subject, hypocrisy. How important it is. I have found so much of it in the church. You opened my eyes. You ruined me in the beginning, Father God. You ruined me. You ruined me straight from the beginning. Your revelation came. You just gave it to me. I asked for it, but I didn't know what I was asking. Show me the truth of this world. It lay in darkness, and you showed me every part of it. For 40 years, I've seen it. I've stayed hidden. I haven't really flashed out there too much. But I have it now. I'm an older man. I'm, I'm trying to teach some of it. Now, it's for this reason the Scripture supplies two reasons, two of them. First, from the time that men turned away from God in rebellion, I study Genesis, I love it, they've been unwilling to accept the truth that exposes their unrighteous deeds. We all don't want to do that. I mean, we all do something and, and all of a sudden we want to bury it and kid them and don't want anybody to know because we get embarrassed about it. Make us look bad. Or it could make us look bad in the future. It's whatever the flesh and the devil tells you. Because of this, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Romans one eighteen. Now, I use the word because well, I'm telling you it's true. You know that. But the word confirms things for you. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They suppress it. Right now, we have a lot of suppression of truth in the world. We have such an election going on right now. Just, it's incredible to watch it. We have one party that thinks everybody's stupid and tells everybody that the other person of the party, Republican and Democrat, they say that Donald Trump is a Hitler, Adolf Hitler, and he's horrible, he's a bad man, we can't. We have to stop this for, at any cost. And, and if you kept up with things, you know that the, the Democrats are putting up somebody that's a liar, complete liar, and try to tell you that it's not a lie. So they're making up, down, bad, good, and dark light. Second, the rebellion against God. They suppress the truth, the first one. The second, the rebellion against God exposed humanity to the dominion of the God of this age. That's the second revelation there. It's exposed Satan. He doesn't like that. Satan who deceives the whole world. Revelation 12.9. Deception is the primary weapon that Satan relies on to, to keep humanity under control and in his grasp. All humanity. Every part of it. Don't think that there's, you know, most little outbreaks of darkness. No, there's different degrees of darkness, but it's still dark. Once his ability to deceive is stripped away, which the Word does, revelation from the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, Satan, he's got nothing to offer anyone. Not a lick, not, no, there's nothing to offer. As you have to place with him, in the lake of eternal fire. I mean, he offered people, I'll, I'll help you live forever, for a long time. Well, you'll rule and reign here on the earth and so forth, give them power and juice them up and 
give them that worldly spirit that just helps them and so forth in every area of their life until they don't until he comes to collect his due and he'll kill you and you'll go to hell God turns you over uh, you, you, you could talk to them till your, your tongue falls out they're not going to believe anything because God turned them over and if you'd have listened to the Holy Spirit you wouldn't waste your time on them you'd go find somebody that will receive the Lord I've done that to nice wonderful I thought they were great people intelligent refined uh, experts in their fields whatever they may be uh, enjoyable to be with at times and not receptive to the gospel at all their eyes darken over they look at you funny being nice that they didn't kill me but you could see later on a couple of them wanted to oh you're a Christian it's almost like I'm, you know, you've been undercover this whole time and you got into my inner court and you're a Christian one of them deception once his ability stripped away he had nothing to offer you except eternal fire and that's it I don't care what all the other stuff it goes fast 70, 80 years goes quick now over many centuries I've noticed this human philosophy it's never been able to produce a satisfactory definition of truth for me or anybody else I mean, I've looked now, on the other hand, the Bible gives the threefold answer. If you look deep enough, you'll see it, and men have written about it. I got it from, from E.W. Kenyon and uh, who else? Kenneth Hagin, Jesus, of course. I have lots of Baptist ministers who is, it all escapes me right now. Um, Derek Prince is another great, great minister. Jesus said, I am the truth. This is the threefold. John 14.6 Second says, in prayer to God the Father, he said these things. The word is truth. The word is truth. John 17.17 17. Third, John tells us, the Holy Spirit is truth. So we have these three things. John, 1 John 5.6 is where Jesus sent this. Let's go over them again. The Bible has a threefold answer to this. You can look at philosophy or you can look at all kinds of cults. You can do anything you want to. But here it is. This is what I found throughout the Bible. Especially in the New Testament. Go to the New Testament. It tells you all about it. Jesus said, I am the truth. Himself. Person. Jesus. That's John 6, 14, 6. Second, in prayer to God, the Father, He said this. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. John seventeen seventeen. Whenever he, he the devil came against him and tried to tempt him to do whatever he's going to do, whatever it may be, and there was every temptation, every, everything that came against him, he always used the word. He would use truth against him. He, the word. He didn't call him nasty names. He didn't say, you're going to burn in the lake of fire. Oh, you're a bad old devil. He didn't say anything. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. And then Satan would come back with the word. He'd leave things out of it. But you use the word. I tell my friends that. I told my wife that. As mad as he may make, you just don't say nothing to him. Third, accept the word. The third part of this is John tells us this. The Holy Spirit is truth. First John 5, 6. Now, I can't emphasize these three any harder than I'm going to. But this is it. This is what you learn. No matter how intelligent you may be, I've read all of Watchman Nee and it's just wonderful. But what did I get out of it except a lot of information, which is, is good. It spoiled me in many ways. Uh, it, it did, and it has. It was, but, but the basic things that you can boil down. In the spiritual realm, therefore, there are three coordinates. Three coordinates. You follow these three. The coordinates of truth. That's what you have to have in this dark world. Truth. You don't want nothing but truth. Everything else. It's gray areas. No. Jesus, the Scripture, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Scripture, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus and the Word and the Holy Spirit. These three agree. We know that, and the blood does too. We know that we have arrived at truth. Absolute. Again, we know. We know we've arrived at the truth. The absolute truth with these three. It's important, however, that we check all three coordinates, check them all before we arrive at a conclusion. I was in, in navigational uh, situations in the Coast Guard quite often. We, we had coordinates we had to go by, and it's good if you have a threefold or fivefold crosshairs coordinates 
And you follow them all, and it leads to this one place, which is the truth. That's how we pick people up when we didn't know their coordinates. We didn't know where they were, GPS-wise, or, or uh, even Loran at that time. And you would you would have four or five different ships listen to their signal, and they could they could tell you where it came from, degrees-wise. All of them put it on. You put it on a map where you are, where they are, and they cross here out there in the ocean. And when they cross over, three is great. If you can get four, that's even better. Where they cross is where they are right there, and you have to take into consideration the, the currents. They're going 15, 16 miles an hour in the currents, going downstream, so forth, so on. It's going to take you five, six hours to get there, or you can set a helo out to them. And, and they're going to be downstream a little bit, and you have to take into coordination, can, can take into uh, these conditions exactly where they're going to be, and they're in these coordinates. Now, these, these, these three questions that we must ask concerning any of these spiritual issues, does it represent Jesus? And the coordinate, there's something you can use. That's the truth. As, he, as truly as, as he is, he's truth. Is it in harmony with the scripture? What, whatever you're seeking, whatever you're going after, whatever's coming to you, what questions you can ask, what prayers you want to pray. Jesus always got his prayers answered. And he would always ask, what's the situation here? God would tell him. He would, he would follow it do it. But he would ask. He never got a no for an answer because he was always praying scripture. Does the Holy Spirit bear his witness to this? There are those three. Jesus, the scripture, and the Holy Spirit. Now, history, history says this. And historically, the church would have been spared many errors and deception. If you will read down through there, you see it now. I hope you see it. If it always checked all three of these coordinates of truth. And they, they did. Some did. Some didn't. Some had all kinds of different doctrines. And they ended up in the trash can, the hooskow. And, and you lead many people, millions of people at times, into error. And most of the time I saw that it was, it was controlling. They wanted to control people, control the money, control it. They didn't have that power. It was demonic. It's not enough that a teacher paints an appealing picture of Jesus as a, a perfect moral example. Oh, he can. They can get up there and they can, orators of the word could just paint these beautiful pictures to you, make you even cry about it all. But it's a moral perfect example of Jesus. Or or that the pastor batters his congregation with a barrage of scripture verses over and over and over again. I've been to churches and listened to ministers that use the Old Testament and just beat you to death. Some use the New Testament and they don't preach a well-rounded sermon which has to do with these three truths. Or that the evangelist, well, he impresses the audience with his only display of supernatural power. Okay. Just because the Holy Spirit is operating in the gifts of the Spirit doesn't mean the man that he's operating through is sanctified. It doesn't. I've seen this many times. Now, before these three things have to line up, if he's doing something that's not scriptural, I don't care what you see. If those three don't line up, Jesus, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit, something's off. Before we can accept what, what is present to us as truth at that time, like I just told you, all three of these coordinates must be in place. I just believe this with my whole heart's what the Word says. Jesus, the Scripture, the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Scripture, and the Holy Spirit. The distinctive function of the Holy Spirit, what, what is he supposed to do? He bears witness. He, he bears witness. It is the Spirit who bears witness. Verse John 5, 6. He bears that witness. The Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus as a, the eternal Son of God. Sure he does. Most of the time in that unction, he bears witness inside. It's right. It's a smooth, velvety feeling. If you're okay, I mean, if you're spiritually sound, sure. Now, you you, know, you can't go by your conscience that much unless you, you're renewed. Unless your mind's renewed, the Word of God's in there, you know the difference between you know right and wrong. It's in there hard because there's, there was an old gal that got an abortion recently and she went on TV and said it. I prayed to the Lord over and over again, it was the right thing at this time to get an abortion. I had witness of the Spirit inside me. And I was going, no, you did not, because he doesn't do that. First of all, it's the Word that says over and over again, if you go into the New Testament, they killed babies and sacrificed them to demons all the time. The Holy Spirit doesn't witness to that, because he witnesses to the Word. Jesus said, don't do that, don't do that. No. The Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus as the eternal Son of God, who shed his blood on the cross for us, all sufficient sacrifice for our sins. Now, that, that's the basic one. In the words of, of, of Charles Wesley, he says this. 
and, and there are many others who said the same thing, close to it. The Spirit answers to the blood and tells me, I'm born again. There are times the devil would just come and tear you up and tell you you're not saved. Especially those who get baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. Oh no, that tongues is of me. And I was, <laughs> he did that to me. And I was saying, he did that to me after I was saved about 20 years and did it early on, of course, all the time. And, uh, and and there were many Christians that helped. There was lots of help. They, they weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we make sure you didn't get that. So the devil would use them. And I would just say it like it is. The devil used them to fight. They had doctrines about it. Well, that all passed away, Mike. That passed away with the last apostle. They don't do, nobody does that. You know that. Oh, those are all hyperactive Pentecostals. It's all made up. It's all mind stuff. And I was going, What? I've prayed in tongues for the last 15 years now. You're a little late. And I've seen some most wonderful, gracious things. I've prayed in the tongues and in the spirit when well, I did. I couldn't. English just did. It could not. It was above my pay grade what was going on. And thank God. And I did pray the word. And I spoke the word. And I had my confidence in the Lord. But then I had those tongues. Thank God. And God bore witness of it. That I was born again and not to listen to the devil. At all. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to the truth and authority of Scripture. Period. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, For our gospel did not come to you in, a, in, in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. They all lined up. That's in 1 Thessalonians 1.5. We're going to discuss part of that later on, but in, probably in another teaching. But this is about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? There, there can be no compromise between the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Truth, and Satan. There's no compromise between those two. It, no, Satan, he comes to steal, kill, destroy. He is the father of lies. That's what he does. He's the father of lies. He's a liar, and that's all there is to it. That's John 8, 44. This was demonstrated dramatically in the early church. It was hard. I read the first time I read this. I went, what? I know people who do that all the time. It's worse. And they didn't end up with this. It's when Ananias and Sapphira lied about the money they had offered to the church. And, and they claimed that they had bought, brought this full price for this property they had bought or sold. Whereas, well, in fact, they kept back part of, part of the money. Kept it back. Now, the spirit of truth in Peter, listen to me. He is the spirit of truth. And he was in Peter. He was not deceived. He charged Ananias with lying, not merely to, to men, to Peter, but also to the Holy Spirit himself. The one who is the very spirit of truth. You lied to him. You don't, you don't lie to him. You don't, you don't lie to him. Belly up and tell it like it is. Whatever it may be, don't lie to him. Whatever happens, it comes from God. I'd rather be you know, judged by God once than have 10,000 men pat me on the back and beat me around later. Peter said this to Ananias. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Keep back part of the price of the land for yourself while it remained? Was it not in your own? And after it was sold, was it, was it not in your own control? Why ha have you con conceived this thing in your heart? You not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, well, he fell down and breathed his last right there. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. There have been many people that came to me, many, not just one or two, that said, God told me to give you this, but I can't. Money usually, and I'm not going to. I've had people that just turned around just wrote me a check and, and, and just destroyed it later. I mean, he called the bank and said, don't cash that. I've had people say, the Lord told me to give you this, but I'm not going to because I don't like you. Okay. I don't know what happened to them. That's none of my business. Or said, I had one minister that I ministered for, and I mean God poured out His Spirit, teaching had come forth. It was really great. It was good. I, even I'll say it's good. It was good. And the Lord told me, I told Him to pay you this much money. Because I didn't, go, I didn't, I just, I didn't say, I'll show up for you for $10,000. I didn't do stuff like that. It's whatever. I, my needs being met and so forth. And, and the Lord has spoke to me when I was up on the, the up behind the pulpit, 
And he said, I told him to give you this much money, which I had believed God for, but he's not going to because his wife said to give you half of that and keep back the rest. And he said, tell him. So I was getting ready to leave and I was praising the Lord and, and people stacked up like cordwood. Healing the broken heart came that night. It was what's a wonderful anointing. It helps people go on with their lives. Stuck because they had broken hearts about children dying, about relationships that didn't work, about the boss doing whatever. So many different things from childhood on. And God reveals things. I think I had about 400 visions that night. Little mini visions. They were. It, it's incredible working the gifts of the Spirit that way. And I was kind of tired. I wanted to go home. I went down in southern Louisiana. And as I walked up, the Lord said, tell him. So he handed me a check first, and it was half the money. That's what the Lord said. So I looked at both of them, and he said, you tell them. And I said, all right, Lord. The Lord told, told me and told you to give him this much money. And your wife told you to give him half that. And you did. So I tore the check up in front of both of them. I said, if you need it that bad, you keep it yourself. And whatever the Lord does with you is none of my business. I love you. I won't be back. And I left. I did know what happened. I saw what happened. I was, I was, it, was, it was very sad. And uh, he died a couple years later. And the church dried up, of course. And things happen because you lied to the Holy Spirit. You said, God, you're going to do something, and then turn around because your wife says you're not going to do something, and get yourself in trouble. At all. Now, three hours later, Sapphira came in and it repeated the same lie. And, uh, you know, like her husband, she, she paid for it with her life right there. And they, that used to freak me out. It, it got, got, you know, it, right away I learned don't lie to him. Don't say you're going to do something and don't do it. You say you're going to do something now and can't do it. It was a different thing if you talk to him. Now, rightly defined, the sin of Ananias and Sapphira, were, they were guilty of hypocrisy. Religious pretense. There's a lot of it. They were pretending, and I'm telling you, you come under judgment for it. They're pretending to be more generous and more committed to the Lord than they really were. And I've seen a lot of that. I don't, that's horrible. Jesus reserves his strongest words of condemnation for this, this sin of hypocrisy. Religious leaders of his day, especially seven times in Matthew 23, he said to them, Woe to you hypocrites, he said, over and over again. Our English word hypocrite and hypocrisy, but they're derived directly from the Greek word, now listen to this, hypocrites, hypocrites, which means actor, actor. This is the essential of hypocrisy, acting, putting on a religious act. Probably uh, no sin is more common among religious people than hypocrisy. You full, for church is full of it. I love real people, real things. In fact, some, some forms of religion almost demand it, demand it's hypocrisy. You act a certain way, I'm a priest, hallelujah, I do these things, you're hypocrisy, you're a hypocrite. You can tell by looking at you. You promise certain things, you don't do them anyway. Half the time, these people aren't born again. They're just, it's a job to them. When people enter a religious building, a, a religious building church, or a whole denomination, their demeanor changes. It, it changes. They change. I've watched it. They're not, praise the Lord, hallelujah, how you doing, blah, 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 blah. No, that, that, that they left something at the door. Some religious thing hit them, and now they're going to put on the act. Ministers, too. A lot of them. They're no longer natural and free or open, and all of a sudden there's a spirit of heaviness comes on them, and doubt, and all the rest of it. Do I look all right? I've got to act. They appear to be gripped with some kind of invisible clamp of some sort. I've watched it. They feel required to, to put on a religious mask of, of, of some sort. Different branches of religions may require masks of different kinds, of course, but, but few of them allow people to be their own real selves. Just be who you are. Fake it till you make it. Well, that's some things you have to speak. Though, speak it. Yeah, you have to say it. But but that's lying. Say those things that aren't as though they were. But he didn't say, you know, keep yourself in bondage and pretend you're something else. When the preacher condemns certain sins, these, these people respond with a, a dutiful amen. But they're doing it. Outside the church, they commit all those sins. With, without a twinge of conscience, they do it. Amen. I'm, I'm, there's not much of a spirit of repentance in that place. 
if they prayed out loud, they'd use a special tone of voice. Dear Lord, hallelujah. We're talking yee, yeah, yee, yeah. No. Often a special vocabulary as well. <laughs> I've heard it. Prophecy, too. I've watched it. That's interesting. They don't stop to consider how a human father would feel if her child were to address him with such a artificial language. Uh, my kids don't. <laughs> I don't. I expect respect, but I don't expect to be phony. Because I know they're phony. If they're being phony, they're phony, and I'll, I'll, I'll call them out on it. Quit that. You're not going to get anything from me from doing that. They put on some unnatural form of behavior as well, just to, just to impress me. You're not impressing me. I've been around, and I'm not stupid. God's been around, he's not stupid. He's seen the whole thing from the beginning. The God of the Bible that I know, he has no time for hypocrisy. He does not deal with it. You look at those two. That's just an example for you. Right in the New Testament, right off the get-go. If he wanted fear in his church, that would respect fear. Don't lie to him. Now, this comes out, I think, pretty clearly in Job. Job's three friends, well, they poured forth their torment of religious attitudes and, and longitudes as well. I didn't like their altitude. They, they said, in effect, God always blesses the righteous. They never suffer unjustly. And God always judges the wicked. They never prosper. Yet the facts of history, all history demonstrates that that's not true. It's just a religious talk. I've seen the righteous, oh, some of the most righteous human beings be beat up by the devil to know, in all their lives. The Apostle Paul left here scarred. He was nothing but a big scar. Beat and whipped. He died a couple times. I mean, there's a lot of things that happened for his righteousness. You can speak and claim all you want to. If you're going to do what Jesus wants you to do and go where he wants you to go, you're going to get some opposition. They're going to hate you. They're going to write books about you. And have stories about you, how horrible a person you are. The fact is, the fact of history it demonstrates that that's not true. It's just religious talk. Job, on the other hand, was completely frank. He said, in effect, this to, to God. God's not treating me fairly. He's just not doing it. I've done nothing to deserve this at all. Well, I've heard that come out of dying people's mouths. But even if he kills me, I'll stick. I'll still trust him. Now I haven't heard that. I've heard them. They're so mad at God they can spit. And I, I've told many of them, you need to. You need right now to come to Jesus. You're dying. You're going to meet him here shortly anyway. Well, I thought you came to pray for healing more than I came to pray to healing for you. I came to pray for healing for your soul. This is the first one. Get right with Jesus right now. If he has mercy on you and decides to have mercy on you, he's an individual. He's not a robot. You don't push the right buttons and divine healing comes flashing all over you. And, oh, look at that. Praise God. That's God. No. He's dealing with character and soul from the very get-go. He wants your character. And that's your prosperity. That comes with it. But your character. Now, I quoted Job 42.7 in an earlier teaching. And we talked about Job before. The Lord revealed his, his estimate of the conduct of, of Job's friends in that. He looked at it again. If you look at that again in the light of this, the Lord said to Eliphaz the uh, Temanite, Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken to me what's right, as my servant Job has. Talked right to him. We need to ask ourselves, how do, God will talk to you too. I'm so tired of hearing hearing Christians. I've never heard Jesus. Why don't you shut up long enough, get in prayer long enough, speak his name out loud, confess your sins before him, clean yourself up by the blood of Jesus, which you're allowed to do, which you're supposed to do, and be quiet before the Lord and he'll talk to you. The word of God. And he'll probably tell you, read my word. You don't have any word in you. The devil comes, you can't fight him because you don't have any word in sword of the spirit. You'll have to tell the Lord and tell the devil it comes. Hold on, Mr. Devil. Let me get my Bible because I don't have my sword. I need to read some sword. Read right to him if you need to. Now, how does this kind of religious behavior differ from the sin of Ananias and Sapphira, those two old boys that lied, which cost them their lives? What's the difference here? Well, truth. In this light, it recalls the fact that King David was guilty of two terrible sins as well. And more, but right off the bat. 
First, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He should have been out doing war, but he decided to stay home and look at Bathsheba naked, taking a bath. The wife of his neighbor, Uriah. Then, to cover up his sin, he proceeded to murder Uriah. Well, she got pregnant. Well, what did he think was going to happen? Is a whole lot of birth control back then? No. They, she, she let him know. Hey, we laid together. I got pregnant. Now what? We send Uriah up the front, front of the line, put him up on the front. He didn't want to go. Well, come on home to your wife first. Come on home. And we'll pretend he got her pregnant. Well, that wouldn't work because he wouldn't come home. He's at war. Period. Now, apparently David, now he, he put Uriah up on the front line and got him killed. Apparently David got away with, with all of it, he thinks. He still went out through his, and did his religious form of worship. He did that. He still carried out his duties as king. You can see he did all that. He still lived in a royal palace. He did all that. Outwardly, nothing had changed until God's message. And he took, he took her. Bathsheba, he took her. Until God's messenger, he showed up. Prophet Nathan. Nathan confronted David with, with his sin. At the moment, David's eternal destiny right then hung in the balance. Years at time, there, there, there are some timely things here. Sometimes our our eternal destiny hangs in the balance where you're going. He has a, the days of your life are written in the book. You can mess that up if you want to by sin. Don't make, he made an, he made no attempt to cover it up. He offered no excuses. He acknowledged David did. He acknowledged I've sinned. Second Samuel twelve one through fifteen. After Samuel told him what was going on. One little sheep. They took that little lamb, took it away. Later on, we read in Psalms 51 that David offered up a prayer of confession and then cried out for mercy. Verses 15 to 16. Each begin with the word, Behold. 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 Suddenly. Behold. It's a, that's an expression of revelation of vital truth. Just came to you. Boom. God, behold. Behold. Who do they say I am? Peter says, You are you are, you are, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Behold. He said, My Father showed you that. Then he turned right around and said what the devil said. And Jesus called him a devil. And I'm sure Peter and the boys talked about that for well, one minute. I was praised because God heard from God. The next minute he called me a devil. Verses 5 says this. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. That, what that means is you, you're a sinner. You were born in sin. Hello? David got that revelation. He come to face to face with something that only the spirit of truth can reveal to him. You were never righteous. Honey, you were born in sin. You were born dead. Now, that's everybody here. That's what you received from your, your descendant Adam, a sinful inheritance. Everybody, after Adam, all Adam's children were sinners. God made me. No, he did not. God did not make you. Those attributes are still there. There are some, there's little things that are left. But if you really want to look around things, this whole sway is under the power of the devil, of the whole earth, under that sway. All we received was the evil inheritance, sinful, and dwells in every one of us, of all the descendants of Adam. That's why Jesus said, you've got to be born again. We've got to do this all over again. And I make it available for you. I will make it available for you. Now, verse 6 reveals that only the only basis on which God offers deliverance from prayer, or from power, from the power of, of the indwelling sin, the only basis was it, behold the desire, I desire truth in the inward parts. Behold, behold, I desire truth on the inward parts. Don't fool yourself, he's saying. You're a sinner. After his sin, David had continued to go through all the outward forms of behavior that we all do, appropriate to his role as king. He was doing it. But behind the scenes, there was a vast gap between the inward and the outward part of that man, the condition of his heart. He had become a hypocrite. That is a hypocrite. A hypocrite. You act it, but you're not it. An actor playing a part that no longer corresponds to what's in his heart at all. You learned it. You learned the part. You learned how to be a Christian. You were raised in it, but you're not a Christian. You're not born again. That's a horrible thing. Some of the roughest parts that I've ever had is leading Christians to Christ. What? There are, I've, I've met hundreds of Christians in churches that don't know Jesus. They're going straight to hell by their outward man. They're, they're, their outward person has been raised up to do this stuff. They know how to sing. They know how to act. They don't, they don't have to have God in the services. 
You don't need Jesus there. You do not need the Holy Spirit in service to carry on a religious, uh, whatever you call it, act. Honest confession and a wholehearted repentance is what everybody needs. You need that spirit of repentance. You have to have it. Now, this truth runs through the whole Bible. It's there if you'll read it and look at it, have somebody explain it to you, and especially pray and ask God. He'll give it to you. It'll surprise you. Behold, here it comes. God will never compromise with sin. Never. It's all through the Bible. He does not compromise with sin. This is illustrated dramatically by two days, and I have taught so deeply on two days in the life of Jesus. I've taught deeply on this. On Palm Sunday and Good Friday. On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Here he comes as a popular hero. Son of David, oh, uh, praise the Lord. He's, but he's riding a donkey. Here comes that prophet from Nazareth of Galilee, Matthew 21, 11. And they, they, this is it. We're going to make him king now. Hallelujah. The whole city was open to him. He could easily, and his disciples were wondering too, when's he going to pop out what he's supposed to really be? He's supposed to have that armor and, and, and he'll ride in and take over everything and then we'll go to Rome and take that over too. The whole city was open to him. He could easily have moved aside his bitter enemies. He could have done that easily. The religious leaders at the time and established himself as king right there. Now, that's what the people were longing for, and that's what they wanted. But they were reading. They weren't reading the Old Testament. They were reading what the rabbis put together, that the Messiah is going to be this. Well, they, there was a suffering Messiah, but they didn't accept him. And, and the priest all said that, too. He says he's the Son of God, but he doesn't match up with the picture that we have right there that we put together, that we put together, that we put together. Not the Holy Spirit, we. There are those that do. There are those that... There were, there were the Holy Spirit in the temple of God, where the temple... You, you, they tore down. When, when Jesus died on the cross, and it was finished, in the Holy of Holies in the temple, there was a curtain. And it was badger skin, I believe heavy, was ripped from the top down and, and thrown aside. Now, if you were a priest and had duties in there, now the Holy Ghost wasn't in there. He wasn't back. And God was not in there anymore. He left the temple a long time ago. You know, nobody was going to get killed. But they acted like it. When you were a priest and had duty and you had to go in and change out the showbread and candelabras and the incense in there, that's at the Holy Holy place. The holy holies is behind that other veil. There were two veils. And that old boy walked back there to start cleaning things up and, and doing his duties back in there and looked over and the, that curtain was torn. It was open to the holy holies. Now anybody was back there that didn't have blood and wasn't covered with blood and wasn't ready to sprinkle with blood, oh, the high priest of the time, you get killed. That, that, that was a place you did not mess with. You would have killed. The power of God come out and kill you. And they looked, that curtain was gone, and there was no, no power. It was all gone. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He was now the inviting, all full of God himself. Now, Jesus could have done that right then. Could have took it. I am the king. But he didn't do that. He chose another way. He was led by the Holy Spirit. Five days later... He hung, rejected, and naked on a cruel cross. On that cross of Golgotha, right there, he, was, he went that way. Why? Because God will never compromise with sin. He wasn't going to compromise with it. He wasn't going to be, I'm going to be the king of whatever. And compromise. No, when Jesus comes back, boy, it's going to be rough. I told people all the time, they want Jesus back here. I want the Lord to come and said, you haven't read your Bible. He will never be the sender. People you love are going straight to hell. They've never dealt with the sin problem in their life. Never rejected it, that sin. God doesn't compromise with it. God never compromised with sin. And the only way to deal with sin was to sacrifice Jesus on the cross. That was it. Because everybody was the sinner. Many Christians, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever shall call upon His name follow him, bow your knee, you live forever. Big Christians today are speaking and praying about revival. I hear them all the time. Lord, give us revival. We need a revival. 
Now, they overlook the facts, and I have prayed this more and more. Give us a spirit of repentance, please, Lord. Let us see our sin. Let us see we're dirty, we're nasty, we need you. That's how revival comes. These are Christians that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the world. You can go into a beer joint and yell, everybody's going to hell here, and they will not fight with you. We probably are. We probably are. I used to go into Woody's and Moab, Utah, the beer joint, and go in there and get a couple of my friends out and just tell them about Jesus, sit there and talk with them. Nobody liked me doing that. I was not going to fall back into sin. And I got one or two of them. We got them out of there. Got them saved, born again in spirit fields. power of God moved in them. I don't know what they did with it. I moved a couple years later. I don't know what they did. I know I followed them around trying to keep them out of sin. They often overlook that fact. That there's no barrier to revival that can never be bypassed. You cannot bypass sin. That cannot be bypassed. Until sin is dealt with, true revival can never come. That's what the Word says. And you'll learn it, and you start dealing with it, fasting and praying for, for people that they deal with the sin. And there's only one way to deal with sin. He who covers his sin is not and will not prosper. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. I'm reading out of the Old Testament and the New, too. Now, frankly stated, I don't mean to be mean about this, but there are many sections of the contemporary church that are full of covered sin. They cover it up and be the hip- hypocrites and put on a smiley face and you've got your church stuff on. Here we go. But you get a prophet in there that is full of the Holy Ghost and tells people like it is and, and Jesus exposes things. He's going to expose your sin because he can't bring refreshing until that sin is discovered and taken care of and put under the blood of Jesus. Then refreshing comes. Look, I've been in churches as a prophet and they did not like me, but I went anyway because I was supposed to. And I find these things that people cover sin about and here are a few of them, just a few. Abuse of children. Boy, I saw that a lot. Physical, emotional, sexual abuse of children, or a combination thereof. I don't like them. Pedophiles and, and murders, hypocrites. I know. It, it is, gets worse than that. Broken marriage vows. It seems like everybody had sex with anything, with everybody. And I was going, well, what's the, what are you doing? This stuff will kill you. This is a great one because I went to churches that had a lot of businessmen. I'm undealing, unethical dealing with money. I, I, I went and, and, and dealt with a, a man who was a businessman. He was having sex with his secretary. He was married and had kids. She was too. And I was doing, I was putting a big air conditioning system in with another fellow. And uh, halfway through it, I had to tell the people, I, I got to have to go now. If I have an emergency rose up, I'll, I'll show up back here tomorrow. And uh, I I put an air conditioning system in there in a window in a big big window unit in their bedroom so they'd be cool at night. But I went and the Lord had told me he's having sex with his secretary and and Satan wants to kill one of his judgments coming one of his children are going to be killed. And I said okay, but if you'll head it off and he'll stop doing it, things bad things will happen, but he'll be all right. And I went told him he shut the door on me and I had another Christian man in there. And he said, how did you know this? How, how, are you following me around? I said, no, I was working and the Lord told me. He came upon me and said, put your tools up and go talk to this man. You seem to be very important to him, so I'm going to. I wouldn't give you the time of day. I don't think you're worth the powder that it takes to blow you to hell. I didn't like him. But God liked him. And he asked me, do you know which son's going to die? I said, what does it matter? You think you can quit? Messing with that secretary, because she's got kids too, and she's getting on her. You're opening the door for the devil. And the importance, and you're an elder in the so-called church, you're hiding your sins. Long story short, he quit doing that. One of his kids did fall through a building roof two stories up and hit the concrete, but he he had a spray pack on his back that was full of a light acid it, it absorbed a lot of his fall. He went to the hospital, of course, stitched up, torn up, but he didn't die. Unethical dealings with money was just rampant payoffs, and that gets tiring. Pornography, I had so many pastors that porno, 
and youth pastors. I had two youth pastors that were ped- pedophiles. We had sleepovers at home. And I mean, that's, that, I can tell you, it was horrible things. Gluttony. Transsexuals. In the church. In order to appetites of all sorts. I had lesbian friends. They were, they were kind of friends. You could witness to them. You try. I love these people. I did. The, you know, they're, they're not horrible, gross le- lesbians. These lesbians that love Jesus. They asked me to come to Bible study several times. I said, I, I can't. You're not, you don't love Jesus. You love something about You've made him in an image. Well, we read the Bible. I said, well, you're, this is a whole bunch of it. I'm no better than you. But I have forsaken certain things that threw him away. I'm not going there. You need to forsake him too. That's how God made me. I said, God didn't make you this way. Now, God's remedy for this is twofold. Confess it, forsake it. And I told them over and over first, you have to confess this before the Lord and forsake it. And they couldn't do it. I can't do it. I was made this. I can't do it. They were told 10,000 different things they couldn't do. You can't forsake it. Because, because, because and they can't confess it. Because it's, we don't think it's true. Okay, well, they, they have pernacled you. It's seldom easy to confess your sins. It really is. Yet there's no other remedy. I have not found one. I have not found one or seen one or felt one. In the presence of God Almighty, which He's always been, I never have a Bible study without God's presence. I never had a prayer meeting without God's presence. I did, whether it was ominous or whether it was gleeful and wonderful, which many of them are. But you come against the powers of darkness, you're going to have a fight with them too. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you have to start there. First John one nine, God has never committed Himself to forgive sins. That we're not willing to, to confess. He didn't look over it. He didn't wink at it. He will catch up with you someplace. You're going you're gonna to deal with it. With God. And it's not enough merely to confess it. You have to forsake it. We must make a resolution. Don't be a hypocrite to determine not to continue to commit that sin that we've confessed. I mean, you're going to have... Some of you will bleed out your your pores. Like, you know, Jesus, they put the sin of the world on him and he was just bleeding blood, sweating blood. Angels were helping him maintain that his life to, to pay for that those sins of the world. And I mean, that imagine that you're having problems with a few things. Imagine him. Imagine that garden started in the garden, ended up on the cross, but he paid for every sin that was ever committed from Adam to the end, all of it. It was eternal by the eternal Spirit. But that's our last teaching was like they talked about it. We 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 ought to follow the the succinct advice, the exact advice that that Daniel gave the king to Nebuchadnezzar. Break off your sin by righteousness, he said. Break it off by righteousness. Confess it. Forsake it. Whatever's not righteous is sinful. Are you face to face with a difficult decision? Any of you? We've all been there. Whatever it may be, whatever has been pricking your heart, even a little bit, you have to start con- be conscious of it. Because we're right in the end. These are the end times that God's using people, but He has to have you need character. In this chapter, of all these things that I've talked about, in this teaching, do you question things in your own life that you've been pretty much accepting, and it's confronted you in some area or disobedience you've you've done and it's not all the time but it comes you need to open up to the spirit of truth he's not going to kill you or he would have already he's ready and willing to help you if you'll do it if you if you'll just get with the program and start confessing your sins before him you don't have to have a lot of bawling and crying and screaming oh my god i'm so horrible hey he knows what you are you know what you are get with the program now why is it so important to coordinate these three lines of truth Jesus the scripture and the Holy Spirit when we go back over things if they're, they have to be in agreement if they're not in agreement you're, you're out of whack I do this I do that does, it, does the Holy Spirit yeah the Holy Spirit says okay but what about the Bible does the word say stay away from that don't do that is your look I know a lot of people that have bad company and they say that well I'm witnessing to people no you're not you're doing what they do and they think it's okay because they know you're a Christian, so you're saying it's okay to do what you're doing. I know Christians that drink. I don't have anything to say about that except 
don't. Don't. There are some alcoholics that are delivered, in, they're in Christ, but they can never touch booze again. And they say, you're drinking, man, yeah, it's okay, and they have a drink, guess what, they're back, back in the gutter again, and you caused it. Paul said, I'll never eat meat again. I'll never do this again. I'll, I'll watch myself. Anyway, have you been, has, has your heart been pricked on those things, whatever it may be? Whatever it is. Gossiping. There are so many different things that the Lord wants you to get away from because it gets you away from Him. You need to deal with it. It's between you and Jesus. Start dealing with these things. Father, we just praise you and thank you for that. The Word says this, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, five. Go to the Lord. He is faithful. He always will. And I don't care what Christians have done to you. They're not Jesus. Christians are poor human beings like you. They make mistakes continuously. Some of them are rough. Some of them are hard. Some of them are, and almost all of them are hypocrites to some point until you just don't care anymore. Until you get to the point where it's just Jesus and you and it's the Holy Spirit just pounds them to, to powder. Eventually it's just okay. You go to a church and they hurt you or whatever it might have been. No. It's not them you have to deal with. There's no Christian going to get you into heaven. There's no Christian that's going to bring prosperity to you. No Christian's going to bring, very seldom they bring chicken soup because you don't feel well. Open up. Confess your sins and he's faithful to forgive you of all your unrighteousness. He is. And then go on from there. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Does this help you? Good. This is Mike. I'll see you next time.